Good morning. We are here today to participate in the squaring in of newly appointed members of the Colorado Senate. Senator Peter C. Groff, Senate District 33, resigned his seat with the Colorado Senate effective at 12.01 a.m. May 7, 2009. The Secretary of the Senate has received Senator Groff's resignation letter as well as certification from the Secretary of State that Michael Johnston was appointed to fill the vacancy created by the resignation and that Mr. Johnston has been determined to possess the constitutional and statutory qualifications to serve as state senator. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, may I introduce the Chief Justice of the State of Colorado, Justice Malarkey. She will be administering the oath. Thank you. And if you would each please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, state your name, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. And of the State of Colorado. And of the State of Colorado. And faithfully perform the duties of the office of state senator. The office of state senator. To which, to which I was duly elected. To which I was duly elected. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. You. Uh, we are tremendously, tremendously lucky and honored uh, to have you uh, join us. So at this time, it's uh, my privilege to ask you if you would like to say some words to the supporters and the onlookers, the gawkers, if you will. <laughs> but, uh, the microphone is, is yours uh, if you choose. in the Colorado Senate is not to speak after Senator Stedman. <laughs> so, noted. Um, I um, was not ready to make some comments, but I will uh, do my best. Uh, uh, the first person I would like to thank is, I was laughing when I was standing back there, that's the first of many times I'll be standing in this room not knowing where I'm supposed to be going and what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but I think of the last time I felt like that much of a rookie, and it was the the first day I signed up to start teaching high school English down in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, I was teaching high school English in Greenville, Mississippi, and, and on that day, uh, the first day I started, I met um, a person who would become not just my life partner, but my inspiration for the work that I do, and someone that not just supports me in what I do, but it deepens my conviction to all the things that I do. So I want to thank my wife, Courtney, uh, wherever she is right now. <laughs> children. Is that <laughs> so I, I would briefly reinforce Pat's statements uh, on this theme of equality, which is when I was coming out of college, I wanted to be a part of somehow making the world a better place. And as someone who had been a lifelong student of, of Dr. King and the American Civil Rights Movement, I felt like I had missed my chance to somehow shape America in a way that would make it more open to all people. And then the more I looked, the more I realized that uh, despite many of the formal barriers to equality being lifted in this country, there was still profound inequality and in access to opportunity. In a country where still less than 9% of poor kids will ever actually graduate high school and go to college, uh, there is something deeply broken. And although we may have succeeded in lifting those formal barriers, I like to say that it doesn't matter where you sit on the bus if you can't read the street signs when you drive by. And it doesn't matter what college you can apply to if you can't write the personal statement to get in the door. And so what remained was this question for us, is when it comes to that old document that feels especially hallowed here, that opens with, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal, 
The question is now, what will we do in this generation to deliver on that promise? And in a day and age where even in this state, the zip code that you're born in, or the amount of money your parents make, or the color of your skin, has more predictive quality for your life chances than what's inside your head or inside your heart, means there's something deeply broken still. So I feel honored that my work as a teacher, and my work as a principal, uh, and my work as a lifelong advocate to make sure that everybody who walks in the door of this capital or across the borders of this state has a real chance at the American dream, and I feel like that is our sacred vow to defend in here. So I like to say to our teachers when we start at the end of the year that the, the first line of that declaration is actually less important than the last line. And the last line of the declaration says, in order to preserve this declaration, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And I've learned already that I've pledged my fortune, but I didn't do <laughs> But I think that that's a profound point, that the promise of equality is easy. It's an easy thing to say. The defense of it is what is so difficult. And so what begins now is I'm honored to take this pledge of the members in this body to defend that declaration. And I'm even more honored to begin the work of working with everybody outside of this building to begin to see what we can do to make sure that that promise is not a hollow one, but a real one. So I'm honored to be here, and thank you so much for having me.